Welcome to Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle. Coming up on the programme this week. In our organisation, there's a combined experience of about 100 years of mental health nursing. But what that's taught us is how to communicate with people and at least how to listen to people. For you to then say, not only is there a life for you, but also there are people around you who want to find value mm-hmm. in you and you can find value in them. Uh, that, yeah. is, that a, is that a big leap? to take or is that is that or is that the start of a journey which gets you to a place of understanding that i think when when we look back at the past year if you look at the good things that have come out of the past year it's all been people driven so when i work either one-to-one or in a group with somebody and i i use these real life kind of topical examples it's really easy to say that's the power of uniting that's the power of people that's the power of understanding what you have versus what you don't And I'll be reminding you how you can make connections with mental health organisations within your community. It's Mental Health Monday. Here we go, another monumental moment for Mental Health Monday. And I'm absolutely delighted to bring you episode 200 of the podcast. 200 different episodes of Mental Health Monday and then some over the last uh, few years. God blimey, I never thought we'd get this far. Well, I kind of did because I kind of thought... There's enough people who want to talk about mental health to maintain that level, but whether or not they'd want to engage with me, well, that was a slightly different matter. Uh, So here we are. Now, in terms of episode 200, I wanted to sort of make sure that um, I remembered where Mental Health Monday came from. Of course, born out of Radio City Talk in in Liverpool. Uh, So speaking to this week, a Liverpool organisation that's doing things a little bit differently when it comes to mental health. We'll hear from Matty Kane from the First Person Project wanted to say thank you, though, for, for everybody who's supporting Mental Health Monday and continues to support it uh, as well. From episode one when we had uh, Luciana Berger, the MP, uh, then MP, on the programme, episode 100 with our Shoes Project at St. George's Hall and every single conversation that's happened in between. It's been a really, really special time for me to put the show together and will continue to be something that I do uh, with episode 201. 202, 203. They're all on the way. Don't you worry about that. Uh, More than ever, I'm keen to share your stories as well. Get involved in the Mental Health Monday Facebook group. Um, You'll see it with the logo which matches our podcast. Uh, You can post in there events that you're involved in, conversations you want to get started around mental health. Maybe suggest some guests uh, as well, people who are having fantastic conversations. Uh, I'd love to get you involved in that one, the Facebook group there. If you're able to tell people you're listening to episode 200 of Mental Health Monday, that would be really uh, helpful as well. Also, if you've ever appeared on the show, I've put together some artwork um, that will represent the uh, guests that we've had over the 200 episodes of Mental Health Monday. And I'm wary of saying 200 guests because it isn't, because we have multiple guests on multiple shows. We've had many, many uh, different people on the programmes as well. So we're probably closer to 250, 300 guests who have appeared overall. But there's a piece of artwork I'll put on social media. I'll also post it on the Mental Health Monday uh, group as well, ahead of episode 200 going live. Uh, Thank you for all your kind words. Thank you for supporting the show. It's here to stay and will continue as well. Uh, Thank you as well uh, to the warm words that I received uh, in a letter from uh, Kensington Palace. Um, So that was nice to receive as well. Some warm words about the programme from the Duchess of Cambridge. So I really appreciated that too. Uh, Let's crack on though. The conversations continue. The conversations do not stop on Mental Health Monday. Matty Kane is our guest from the First Person Project. All the details about how you can connect with him and the involvement that he has in terms of a website, contact, connections, that's all on the way. But we welcomed him to the programme as our guest on episode 200 of Mental Health Monday. (laughs) <laughs> thank you very much. No, thank you for, for having us on. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. You know, I've been a fan for a long time with the stuff that you've done, uh, going way back, to be fair. Well, thank you very much. Well, it, well, it's good to get you on, and it's uh, thank you for your, for your kind <laughs> words. You know, I'm going to soak them up, you know, 200 episodes. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a long old journey, isn't it? No, absolutely. Um, you've kind of got a couple of, well, you've got various different hats that you, you wear yes. in terms of the yes. conversation that we're going to have. We'll talk about the work you do through the first person project, but also your, your mm-hmm. professional career as well, as uh-huh. well as your personal personal experience of mm-hmm. of mental health and i just wondered sort of does one flow into the other does one come from the other just tell us a little bit about my, maybe why mental health yeah. became a thing for you in the first place as a, as a potential career path yeah um well i mean as as many of us do really i think the public perception with nurses which is what i am by profession i think it's if people think it's this altruistic journey and we're kind of you know designed to do it type of thing well that's not the case with me i fell into it um, my background is i'm from the everton 
area, the Liverpool, born and raised. Um, typical upbringing on a, on a council estate there. And what I found is, is, is the values it shaped, the values from that estate particularly shaped me and the people I met. And, and my family are essentially still there now. Uh, the most kind of, the most notable member of my family was, was my mum. Um, and she she sadly she sadly passed away in 2018, which is kind of jumping forward a little bit, but we will get to that. But it was her influence as a person, really, and her resourcefulness with, with not a lot of resource, um, which which made me realise the power of people quite early on. Um, although I didn't I, I didn't realise that at first. I felt I was a joiner first, um, and then you know as as things happened, you know apprenticeship it came to an end and, and, and I was laid off and I had a choice to make so I went into, into mental health and um, having been a kind of part-time football coach before that so I knew I could work with people and um, that was around about 18 19 and then it went from it went from there the first time I met somebody with a at least what I what I knew was a mental illness um, it, it took me aback it wasn't at all what I thought it was going to be you know my perception at that point was probably the same as many other people's it was quite a it was quite a narrow perception to be fair um, a perspective I should say and um, yeah I entered the world of mental health and eventually became qualified as a mental health nurse and that journey took me right around the country into a variety of leadership positions uh, in the NHS for 10 years managing and leading a variety of services, like I say, from the North East right down to Cambridge and across. Uh, I came back to Levantine um, to return home and because I wanted to to return back to where I was from and to try and have an impact locally. Uh, Liverpool means a lot to me, uh, as it does to, I think, anybody who comes from Liverpool, I think. So I uh, returned back and quite quickly, my world was turned upside down. Like I say, my mum died quite suddenly. She died of sepsis. It was out of the blue. Um, she she was hospitalised, and within eight days she had, she had, she had died. And for the eight months after that, my my world completely changed. Um, I I did I did experience mental illness, uh, depression, anxiety, quite bad. Uh, I sit here now, um, you know, not not ashamed to say that it was a dark time at that point. And you know, I did I did contemplate ending everything, uh, plan things, and you know, as as people do. Fortunately, I didn't go down that road. Um, you know, suicide is a, is, is a permanent solution to a temporary problem, as they say, and, and that's, that's definitely the case. And what got me out of that really was, was thinking about the resourcefulness of my mum and people like my mum, and then thinking about, well, what was I doing with the skills that I'd, 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 I'd built up at this point? And what it was, Mick, was it was, it was kind of a, it was a defining moment really in that I entered the world of mental health um, with these skills and resources already kind of within me, these values are already within me. And then my, my professional journey, basically what, what I'd started to do and what I noticed a lot of colleagues started to do was professionalise the problems of the, uh, of, the, of the people that we were working with or pro professionalise the lives of the people that we were working with. So we would start conversations with these people with how can I help? And I really thought about that and I thought, on one hand, like I say, that's caring, and that's altruistic, that's kind of the stereotypical thing that we're supposed to do. But equally, the connotation there is that we're disempowering these people by saying, how can we help? Well, who are we to help in the first place? You see, it's a professional, it's a professionalised approach to these just problems and, and, and kind of peaks and troughs of life. Um, so I realised I'd be doing a disservice to my mum and people like my mum um, if, if I didn't do something with these skills. And 2018, the first person project was born, incorporated in 2019, and here we are. Um, which is, I, I thank you for that sort of like that that potted history actually, but it, it gives it gives people a real sense of sort of where you've come from and and, and what you've mm -hmm. experienced. And so sorry to hear about your mum and uh, the situation thank you. there. Um, thank you. In terms of the, the the question that you asked there, you know, how can I help? There's nothing necessary. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that question, is it? No, how can I? That's a, no. that's a nice thing to do. But actually, it's interesting though that you, you you speak more about the fact that in your mind, the just thinking about that question made you mm -hmm. think: is there another approach, and what is mm -hmm. that other approach? And and you yeah. say that that other approach is more born out of your sort of your social background, the things that you experienced. Uh -huh. Growing up, for people who don't know that part of of Liverpool, we could literally speak for hours and hours and hours about the problems 
that exists yeah. within an inner city Liverpool and the, the negative aspects of life. Yeah. And that could be life expectancy, education. But also we could probably speak for even longer about the sense of social value, the community Absolutely. spirit within those areas as well. So how do you how do you how do you build that into somebody's mental health experience? How do you build that uh, into mm. somebody's resilience, if you like? OK, OK. So, well, first of all, it's it's our approach at the first person project. It's it's we call it mental health action, and it's a very deliberate it's a very deliberate use of terms. Really, um, there's a there's a common misconception that mental health awareness. Um, well, we need more mental health awareness. We don't. We have a lot of mental health awareness. In fact, there are, are, are a, I mean a, a multitude of organisations, charities, third sector organisations, public sector, you know, out there now promoting and making people aware of mental health. But two things. The first thing is when you when you engage in these sessions and this this awareness, what they're making you aware of is mental illness, not mental health. They're talking about the common stats, facts, figures, one in four people experience mental health, so on and so forth. They tell you about the different types of mental illnesses. They don't talk about mental health. They talk about mental illness. And the first problem is the stats say that one in four people at some point in their lifetime will experience a mental health problem. So if you focus your training around mental illness, then you're only just, you're only meeting the, the needs of one person out of four. Whereas if you focus on mental health, you reach your four out of four. So focus on mental health is the first point. So that feeds into our overall overall philosophy of mental health action. The other thing that feeds into it is um, is is the evidence base around community development, particularly an approach called asset based community development or ABCD. And the kind of founding premise of that is this idea of focusing upon what's strong versus what's wrong. So we start a conversation with what's happening, what's, what's, what, what do you have already? What skills and assets do you have available to you now? Uh, and that, that in itself is, that's, that's a couple of sessions, you know, it's not something that somebody from, say, the Liverpool Six area where I'm from, it's not something that somebody could just answer because of their confidence, self-esteem, you know, um, philosophy of themselves. And um, so we work with people around that. But the first thing is, what asset skills and capabilities do you have that you maybe don't know about? And then, what about your neighbour? What about their neighbour? What about? And, and, and we literally go around an estate, and then we introduce people to, to each other, but based upon their skills rather than names and, and, and defining problems. And then, much later, then we introduce the issues that are, that, are, that are facing people both individually and as a group. And then we say. Well, we've actually already identified a series of, of solutions to this, which you haven't had to involve an outside institution or outside agency yet. yet, right? And then we say, how can we fix some of these problems with the skills that we've identified? And then we ask the question, well, what problems are still left that we need an outside agency to fix? And it's at that point we go to our colleagues in the NHS, uh, GP surgery, social services, so on and so forth, and we ask them for the help that they are professionals you know to provide and uh, i am myself like you know i still i still work in the nhs uh, as do as do three of my first person project colleagues we're still frontline nhs nurses um a part-time well full, full-time but part of the week um yeah that's 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 how you do it it's interesting that because you know as an idea that sense that you know you you build the, the community right. into mm -hmm. somebody's personal journey mm -hmm. which um you would think, well, that's got to be positive because with community comes communication, a sense of place, a sense of sort of awareness of, a, of, a, of an area in which you're from and a sense of, of belonging as well, which yeah. I, I presume will, will boost someone's sense of um, self-esteem and their sort of uh, yeah. their sort of personal belief as well. Yeah. Um, where, where, did we, where did we lose that? Or, or did, we, did we ever have it? Was, was community, yeah. is, is that a myth? Is that, you know, where, where, what's the story no. there? This is this is we we've in, in, in we never we never lost it necessarily. Uh, it's just become disguised and camouflaged. There's still uh, I'm talking kind of internationally as well. You know, there's still a, a lot of a lot of people like me out there using similar approaches to to kind of highlight the good work that's going on within communities. I think what happened was was it became professionalized and it became kind of. A, a, a professional kind of encroached upon citizen space and and kind of stopped allowing them to tell their story and it became how can i fix what's going on and then over time a kind of self-perpetuating cycle really has, has, has happened whereby 
whereby communities or citizens within the communities become reliant upon services, but services are reliant upon the citizens also. Um, I give the example of, of something like uh, BP, you know, obviously the petrol company. They, they are dependent upon crude oil in order to make petrol. One needs the other. Well, the NHS needs patients. Social services needs people to provide the services to. Uh, the police need people to, to lock up. And it's not, it, this is not a criticism. Uh, and I really want to, I really want to make that kind of crystal clear. Like I said, I still, I still work in the NHS now. And actually we, as First Person Project, are involved in research to look into how we can better support NHS leaders to improve this element of what they do. But, 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 that, um, but, that, but that's, but that's born out of, isn't it, of, of measurements. If there are people hmm. reporting crimes in an area, more police yep. officers will come to that area. If there are cancer uh, patients in a particular yep. area, a specialist centre will be set up. And that's sort of that, that's that measure cause and effect, isn't it? I guess, yep. which is, which people might say, well, that's the best way forward. But actually the stuff that mm -hmm. you're, you're touching on there uh, speaks of a much more rounded sense that it's not maybe individuals that you focus on. It's an investment in, in community and then almost empowering yeah. individuals to play a part within that community. Absolutely, yeah. We talk about this idea of socially progressive mental health. So we, whilst we do the education and the awareness side, and we will do that in the same way that many many uh, other organisations will do it with, through training and things like that, um, we build upon that in a way where we will work with individuals within their communities. We will use action planning and kind of follow that up. Uh, I'll give you an example now. We're working with a, um, a national care provider, a social care provider, and they need a bespoke package um, around uh, uh, around a couple of conditions for one of the uh, one of the service users that are coming into one of their services. And the way we've chosen to do that is we've met with the, the uh, we've had a you know a handover about this this guy's needs and kind of history, but we're also going to meet with his mum. Um, and we're going to talk about what's going on and everything else. And we're going to use this knowledge to design a package with the staff and involve the staff. And it's just little slight nuances like that. And it's it's this socially progressive stuff where the awareness is generated and that's fundamental. But in order for that to stick and be meaningful, yeah, we have to go beyond that. Um, yeah. when, when, when you then sort of... Uh interact with an individual and you've got that you know this yeah. pathway forward obviously you're doing it with a with a sort of a community mind and you know that the people around them and the people who might be able to support them but i guess as well that person still individually still needs to be able to take that step forward as well yeah how do they respond when you set out a pathway which involves maybe people they don't know even though they're you know their neighbors friends and, and, mm -hmm. and colleagues how do they respond to that and if you found that they're more open to respond and take their own individual action once mm -hmm. they've got this framework around them yeah i mean you know i, I, I know exactly kind of where you're coming from with it it's difficult i'm not you know i, I, I don't um, I don't claim any otherwise but you know there's in our organization you know there's there's about a combined experience of about 100 years of mental health nursing, um, and that's only half the workforce. Really, we we have we have other colleagues who bring a lot of other skills and assets to the table themselves. But what that's taught us is that that experience has taught us at least how to communicate with people and at least how to listen to people. Um, and that's it's usually it's usually these 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 fundamentals um, which we, which we fall back upon. And that's not to say everybody gets it. It's not to say everybody flourishes who comes along to, to work with our service you know obviously we have to measure outcomes in the same way that other, other organizations do too but the first part starts with an introduction to the philosophy and a bit of background and why it's important it's it's really easy actually i mean you know we, we, i think when, when we look back at the past year if you look at the good things that have come out of the past year it's all been people driven and um, there's been this is kind of a slight aside here but but it's been in the, in the news the past week about about some of the changes in football. Uh, that's been resolved by people power. Uh, PPE. We had no PPE in the NHS for the for, for the first part of, of lockdown for COVID. You know, it was people that were making it. It was it was gin distilleries making hand you know sanitizers all these things. That's people. And and I think when you draw 
So when I work either one to one or in a group with somebody, and I I use these real life kind of topical examples, which like I say, it's only the past year people can remember it. It's really easy to say that's the power of uniting. That's the power of people. That's the power of understanding what you have versus what you don't. Um, it's yeah, it's this it's this health pro kind of proactive health focus rather than this kind of reductionist narrow-minded illness focus yeah. um, but when you're dealing with somebody who has maybe severe depression or suicidal yeah. thoughts or yeah. sort of major anxieties about sort yeah. of the, the 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 world around them um how open are they to sort of engaging with the fact that there may be solutions mm-hmm. close to them and, are, and around yeah. them because I, I i imagine that's a, a hugely particularly when you're speaking to someone who's devalued themselves to a point yeah where they're thinking it's not worth, you know, potentially living anymore, for you to then say, not only is there a life for you, but also there are people around you who want to find value mm-hmm. in you and you can find value in them. That, yeah. is, that a, is that a big leap to take? Or is, that, is that, or is that the start of a journey which gets you to a place of understanding that? Well, at that, at that point, you know, if, if I was working somebody at that point, um, you, you know, it, it, is, it, is, it is difficult, obviously, because they, they're at that point for a reason. And it's usually things like kind of the, the idea of self and self-worth and self-esteem and confidence. You know, they're not typically in a position where they can or where they can do that, or where they think they can do that. And this is just about being human at this point, listening, being empathic, being compassionate, um, being there for the person. And, and saying, doing what you you say you can do and that you want to do, um, it's not about rushing them forward and sitting down and trying to identify assets with them when they're really struggling to get out of bed. It's looking at their individual context first. And then you can even, I mean, it takes a lot of effort to stay depressed. It really does. And the quickest way to change uh, your emotional state is to change the physical, the physical association, uh, the physical kind of component associated with it. Um, so if you can at least just small steps get out of bed, well, you, that's a start. If you can at least try and have a meal, one meal a day, it's a start. And it's building on that. And it's about celebrating your your, your small wins um, and championing everything, you know, at, at every stage, championing this at every stage and then building upon it. It's not, we're not rushing people kind of out of the homes and into community centers and stuff, you know, in 24 hours. And also, I mean, there's kind of there's, there's three questions we ask when we work with people. The first is about this identification of the individual assets that they have that maybe they don't know about, as well as those around them. And then we ask the second question is, well, how can we how can we use these assets and where do we need a little bit of help from others? And then the third question we ask is, what do, what what can't we do and what do we need outside agencies to help us with? Well, with somebody you've just just like you've just described there, you know, it might be that. These people need NHS services. These people need the the interventions that professionals can offer. And there's, there's absolutely one one hundred percent a place for that. Of course, there is. It's it's this is our approach is is trying to strengthen and trying to reduce that dependency upon services, but, but vice versa, trying to support services to reduce that dependency upon the clientele. Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. We've got Matty Kane with us on Mental Health Monday from the First Person Project. Uh, the website for this one, by the way, firstpersonprojectcic.co.uk. That's firstpersonprojectcic.co.uk. In terms of the referrals and the organisations that you're working with, Matty, where are those sort of um, combinations of conversations taking place and, and how are people making connections and, and uh, you're building that sort of list of people and individuals you're working with? Yeah. OK, um, so this, again, comes back to, to, to kind, of, kind of our approach to it. So rather than rather than targeting the, the mental illness side of things and, and that kind of remedial action, so either taking a tablet or, or, or psychology or something like that, we focus upon the d- determinants of things that make you well or the things that make you unwell. So you, you touched on it earlier on. It's these things like a uh, kind of poor employment or lack of employment, lack of opportunities, uh, poverty, these things. So we focus our interventions upon these determinants. So that means that we have ongoing kind of grant bids and ongoing work with organisations that also work with these things. So our referrals can come from literally anywhere and everywhere. You know, at the minute we're doing um, we're doing one-to-one work. We have got a, a mental health package, which will be free. And that's that's in development. We've got through social media. We've got 
a range of kind of what we call five day challenges around building your self-esteem, confidence, motivation, mindfulness, gratefulness, these types of things. They're free also. So there's really easy ways for people to access these things just for free without even having a conversation with us, really. Um, and then things like um, the the employability work, that, that will be through if you are obviously un unemployed or if you do need to access some support with your mental health, if it's impacting upon your employment or training access, uh, that will be through agencies like the Job Centre. Uh, I mean, literally, you know, mental health teams, anyone can refer to us. It's just get in touch with us via, via the website or via social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, it's really, really well, for, for a socially progressive mental health service you've got to be on on, on social media that that, that absolutely <laughs> yeah. makes sense uh, Matthew we speak, yeah. in, we speak in this week where we're about to hear from the uh, office for national statistics about uh, yeah. suicide figures through the through the period of of, of 2020 and as we speak now we don't we don't have those those figures to hand you're setting up this project you know in 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 uh, that's gone through this, you know, you, yeah. your, you know, prominent first years for the first person project has been this, this lockdown. Um, mm -hmm. What, what have you seen over 2020 um, that gives us a sense of narrative in terms of where, yeah. the, where, where mental health is at and where uh, the mental health of, of the nation is at at the moment? Yeah. Well, we start right at the, at the very beginning, really. Um, I think there's a lot of people who, who say that that the true pandemic is is is, is mental health, mental illness. Um, the problems that we faced kind of predate COVID. You know, the, there was already problems in in our services, access to services, and actually kind of um, uh, effectiveness of services. And again, that's not that's not a criticism. So we already started out uh, in a kind of in in a difficult position. And then COVID's come along. One of the things we've been keen to do over the past 12 months is make links both locally and nationally with a range of uh, suicide prevention organisations. Um, because what we were noticing, both in our work with the First Person Project, but also with our work in the public sector, was that, that this is, you know, as you might expect, an issue. Um, it's now become part of our, of our daily narrative in the NHS to, to have these conversations around the impact of of COVID and how people are managing. I think it always comes back to, to this, this social isolation part and this um, not knowing, not quite understanding what's going on and inconsistency. And that kind of lends itself really to, to, to the approach of the first person project because that's exactly what we, the, the, the way that we come at things. Um, this idea of reducing the you know, exclusion and, and kind of uniting and coming together it's kind of it's kind of helped us to um to, to kind of help others if you like but it's you know it's absolutely been been an issue and, and and you know we are seeing an increase in in the problems that people are facing when when they're talking to us i think not just in terms of suicide figures but in terms of almost like the mental health balance of the nation yeah. obviously we've had this, this sort of terrible impact of social iso social isolation and the issues that have come from that but we've also at the same time had these sort of like new means of communication with the group for carers as well and people coming together and working in slightly different yeah. ways now I, yeah. i'm not for one instance saying that, that that's enough to balance out the, the horrendous things that people have experienced the, mm -hmm. the grief of the pandemic and so on and so forth but i wonder whether or not that might just offer us um a positive, if you like, of, of what 2020 um, might have brought uh, and what we might take into 2021 and the rest of our lives, that, that yeah. sense of community spirit may be appreciating our health a little bit yeah. more, appreciating those social connections a little bit more. Do you think that yeah. that might be something we can actually take forward in terms of our mental health? Absolutely. I mean, what you've... You know, you, you, you've just spoke there in an in, in asset-based way. I mean, this is exactly the philosophy that we kind of hang our approach upon. Um, it's it, it, it's this idea of focusing upon what's strong, focusing upon the strengths and not the deficits. And that's not to say the deficits don't exist or the negatives haven't existed over the past years. Of course they have. I mean, it's, it's, it's so apparent. But actually, you know, you're absolutely right. This, you know, the, the kind of online video conference revolution has happened. People who maybe... Yeah, I, I don't want to say that you know they haven't developed new skills. These skills were there before COVID. They maybe just didn't realise they had them. Um, even large organisations now streamline their approaches so that this type of thing can happen. It's had an impact upon flexible working, um, which we know from other 
evidence is um, is it can have an impact upon on people's mental health and, and kind of quality of life and things like that. So it's had it's had many positive impacts, but it didn't happen by accident. The reason it's happened is because of again, I come back to it: the power of people, the power of creativity, ingenuity, people seeing light where, where where maybe others don't. And it it goes some way to maybe answering you one of your previous questions there about how you how you help somebody in the depths of depression. Well, that's how, that's how, by focusing upon the strengths, seeing the light where there is, and then trying to build upon it as best you can. It's not ignoring the stuff that's going on. It's just trying to cast the light on some of the things that's happening also and not letting the person or why the society forget about that. It, it, it strikes me from, from the conversation that, that we're having about the work that you do in terms of connecting with people within their communities, that it's not just about the individual, it's not about a specific place. But it's yeah. almost about, in terms of people's mental health, four, four words, I'm part yeah. of something. Yes. And I just wonder just how important that is that people, if they haven't found that and they can't find it and they need to go and look for it, how yeah. important is it that they, they find that thing that they are part of, I'm part of, of something as a, as a way right. forward to, that reduces the isolation, that reduces the sense that somebody doesn't matter or reduces the yeah. sense that somebody sits alone in a world with billions of people around them. How yeah. important is it to say I'm part of something? Yeah, it's, 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 it's massive. I mean, I think it's, it's difficult for some people to get to that point. Um, like I say, for, for the reasons I've mentioned before, confidence, self-worth and things, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, I think it's there's, there's there's two answers really. I think it's on the individual to 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 try and refocus themselves and to see that there are strengths where maybe maybe they've usually focused upon the weaknesses or the deficits, I should say. But also the the services. And I'm I'm, I'm talking public and uh, private and third sectors. You know, everybody that type of this type of work kind of redressing their approach and looking and seeing, am I really making a difference? You know, if I'm just providing mental health awareness training, what am I really doing? Am I telling people what my version of mental health awareness is or am I actually giving them what is needed? Am I having a social impact here or am I just interested up in the balance sheet? And it's things like that. Um, and, you know, I think it's asking these really honest questions of ourselves as both individuals and as, as, as organisations. Just, I mean, simply, the, the, the easiest way to look at it is, is when you look at what constitutes good mental health and then and, and you break that down, there's a social and a community and a connective element within that. Equally, when you break down, pick a, I mean, you can pick a mental illness, you know, we can pick any of them. When you break down the, the symptoms of these mental illnesses, all of them involve our relationship with ourselves and the world around us, all of them. So why then? You know, we know from that then that, that mental health and mental illness are far more than kind of chemical, and biological and even psychological things. You know, there's definitely a social and a relational element to it. So why then are, are all of our efforts, well-meaning efforts, but why, why are, are all of our efforts focused towards this idea of fixing things and not involved in one of the strengths that we already have in our but in terms, But in terms of that, the way forward yeah. then presumably is actually to, to embed the, that knowledge within you know human beings from like the yeah. earliest possible age that it's not about yeah. sort of a, a reactive service that comes in when someone's in trouble it's about Absolutely. going through school it's about going through family it's about yeah. messages that you get picked up mm -hmm. through you know all walks of life yeah. that you're part of something you have a role in something and if things aren't going your way there is opportunities to, to fix that and find value else elsewhere that's the way yeah. forward, isn't it? And, and, that, and that's something which means a fundamental shift in the way that we talk about our mental health and our sense of sort of what it is to be a human being in society. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's like what, what I said earlier on. It takes, it takes something like motivation. It takes a lot of motivation to be unmotivated. It really does. It takes a lot of effort to have no effort. Um, so it's just about, it, it, it's not about kind of... Um, it's not about kind of putting these problems on, under a rock and saying that they don't exist, not at all. It's just about reshaping our perspective and just looking at it and just saying, okay, what's actually going on here? You know, do you feel bad all of the time or do you feel bad 80% of the time? That means that 20% you don't. So what's happening in that 20%? How can we build upon that? And it's about taking this longer term maybe perspective, but but looking at, at what, like I say, what we're doing as individuals, but also our expectations of the services that we are using. And, and vice versa, the services that we are using, asking uh, what about what are our expectations of the people who are using our services? Um, we, you know, part of 
kind of part of how the first person project's grown as you know we've got we've got people on board now uh, who, who have kind of strict kind of business backgrounds if you like you know never worked in the middle. and that level of kind of logic and uh, kind of uh, that analytical man works really well with something which is like a social science because it seems so clear to people who haven't been professionalized who haven't been exposed to the maybe the language i have as a nurse it's really simple and it's okay well we do more of that and we do less of that and it really is that easy and um, if we look at take take the community out of it and we, we look at um at a corporation for example there's a lot of a lot of talk now about corporate mental health and improving somebody's mental health in the workplace and most people's, most organisations' efforts kind of start and finish with bringing somebody in to do a mental health awareness package, okay? Actually, that's, that's brilliant. Again, that's fundamental to start. But actually, there's a whole load of things around that that we need to do to make sure that, that we actually have an impact. And that starts at the top of the organisation, right down to the bottom, pulling this golden thread right through of, of culture change, perspective shift, and looking at policies, procedures, um, support mechanisms that are in place. Actually... What do the staff need? You know, do they need the genetic package of mental health awareness or are they okay? Are they quite aware? Can we build on, the, on that? At the time, you know, we, we again, it comes back to this idea of progressing beyond awareness. Everything that we talk about in the first person project revolves around this word progressing, uh, progression or progressing. Our motto is progressing together. Uh, our, our, our kind of predominant model is socially progressive mental health. We talk about asset community development, asset-based community development. It's all about this togetherness, Absolutely. progressing together. And, and I think that makes sense because and uh, it's a conversation I'm having in a couple of weeks actually about sort of businesses who will go, oh, the mental health of our staff is really poor. So we, we mm -hmm. here's a phone line you can call. Right, everybody, back to work. <sighs> And it's the emails still come at 10 p.m. The emails still come at 6 a.m. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, the the long hours, the, the 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 workload that doesn't work, and they go, "Oh, you're struggling. Oh, that's a shame. We'll call this call this number. This this we've been told that this number will solve all of our problems." As opposed yeah. to that much wider thing of going, "Right, what's going on? Why are our staff yeah. feeling like this?" If you make enough changes, you don't need the helpline at all. The help, the help line, well, the help line should be there as like a if you if you absolutely need it. Instead, people are just absolutely. almost seeing that as as like the if you if you're struggling, these these will fix it for you over here, and then come exactly. back into the workplace and carry on working in the same environment that doesn't let you see your kids, that never lets you have a day off, that doesn't pay you when you feel sick. But we've got this help line, and that's fine. That that strikes me as, as wrong, and actually something which every single workplace should probably be thinking about doing something about. Not just because it's not helpful in terms of uh, the staff, uh, the mental health of their staff, but it's probably having a massively negative impact on their staff retention rates. Yeah. Probably having a, a bigger impact on on sick days and and productivity. Yeah. And business is getting wise to that, so almost like more social approach, better understanding of the bigger yeah. picture would benefit them ultimately in the end in many more ways than just mm -hmm. signing up to a, a one-off session if you like that's true i think i think i think i mean that's disappointing and i totally agree i think i think what's more disappointing is um there's a lot of organizations out there who who started off with a with a really kind of innovative uh, new fresh approach whereby i'm talking kind of usually in the third sector whereby they they really wanted to have an impact and, and it started off with something that maybe they seen, I seen a gap, and maybe wanted to to address. And they've gone, they've gone through the struggle of, of having no money as a, as a non profit organisation and building themselves up and everything else. And then what's happened is this opportunity has come along, to deliver. And I, I, I won't mention the kind of franchise package, but there's a there's a kind of well known franchise, uh, probably the most internationally well known um, mental health training package available, which is an excellent package, excellent package, but actually. It's, it's limited in what it can do. And what's happening is, is these really once innovative organisations are, are going along and, and kind of training themselves up so that all they can deliver is that. And then that essentially becomes their business model. So then they're going into organisations that we just spoke of and delivering these one-off packages. And, and then that's kind of it. I, I mean, how was, how, was that, how was that impacting on society? How was that changing things? Um, it's disappointing because... because where you once started with something that was really innovative and impactful, you are now just blending in and doing what was, to be fair, doing what was already there. Um, and it feeds into this kind of, if, if, if organisations, large organisations are looking at that 
and they think, okay, well, the mental health world, that's what they're saying we need. That's Well, then they're going to say that's all we need to do. So we don't need to address the policies and the the, the uh, corporate practices and the demands and expectations that we have on staff because of those within the mental health world are saying this is all we need to do. I, I think uh, so. We have a responsibility. I, and I think actually, and, and that's what I've seen in terms of the, 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 the third sector organisations that do it well, mm-hmm. they almost, they, they, they don't just go, right, we come in and here's all your staff and... Yeah. They disappear and you get a little certificate and you move on yeah. your way. Instead, what they do, they focus on senior management, on HR, Absolutely. and they yeah. have that yeah. sort of they do that specific yeah. focus first, almost like that the top team understand what it is and what they're yeah. what they're going to then pass on to their employees, so that when it yeah. becomes a thing, it's almost not like right the manager's got a meeting now, he's going to disappear, she's going off on a different meeting, head of HR's on on a on a camping trip or whatever. The staff sit down, watch this big mental health thing. Management presume their mental health has been solved within a workplace, and then mm. the staff all go back to work. There's no value in that whatsoever, no. is there? Whereas actually, if the no. management know what they what their staff are about to see, they get a sense of what it is they're about to experience, and also maybe some of the questions that will come up, the obvious practice changes that are needed to sort of enforce some of those changes, and then you get progression, and then you get yeah. something which then has to be, by the way, built upon and reminded, and you know, regularly sort of updated uh, to make sure that those yeah. things are still sticking. No, that's that's absolutely. I mean, that's that's even go go further again and saying that you know the managers need to be part of it, not just kind of in uh, you know a, 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 you know kind of an exclusive kind of conversation with them. Involved, just involved in the training, and actually, m- mental health doesn't clock off at five o'clock. Do you know? Um, I think it's 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 bringing it back to 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 you know what we're talking, what we spoke about earlier on about about this this focus upon health rather than focus upon upon illness. I think it's really difficult to to provide training around around mental health because of the idea of well, it's, everyone's got a different experience, everybody's unique. So if a corporation wants to train 100 staff and they need to do it in a half day training, then then their options are limited. But actually, you don't need a training course to to, to train mental health, to train staff around mental health. You don't just need a training course, you should say. This should come in your one-to-ones, your appraisals. This should come, and you only get that. And, you know, like I said, I, I, I was a manager for many years in the NHS. I've been on, on that side of the table. And you get out of them relationships what you put into them, you know. And, and it's that old kind of um, adage, isn't it, really? If you, if you look after your staff, they'll look after you. And that's absolutely, that's absolutely true. It really is. Um, but actually, where there is space, Mick, is there's a lot of organisations that have committed to, to, to training their staff up in mental health awareness, which is brilliant. But there's still space for organisations who have maybe chosen that that route of just delivering this training with, with, with no other kind of um, kind of wider work. There's still room for them to, to, to improve upon that and go back and, and do it. I think part of the reason you don't see it is because a, a lot of these organisations, whilst being really well-meaning and really dedicated to the work, uh, I don't think they understand how to, how to address policies and stuff because maybe it's not within their skill set, which is absolutely fine as well. But I would kind of ask them organisations to upskill in that area because that's what's really needed if you want to make an impact. Um, 100 as well as that really good fluid knowledgeable mental health uh, ground and absolutely. absolutely and 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 great as well if your staff have an understanding of mental health from 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 years of, of learning about mental health growing up through schools and education yeah. which of course you know if you think exactly. into a workplace that would just be a continuation of that learning as opposed yeah. to it here's here's half a day's training on mental health boom now now you're all fixed um matty thank you so much for your time today really appreciate it thank first you. person project uh, the website first person project cic.co.uk that's first person project cic.co.uk i uh, thank you for, uh, so much for your time thanks for being our, our, our 200th you. episode <laughs> guest really appreciate it all the best for the future and i'm sure we'll speak again very soon cheers thank you very much cheers I hope you've enjoyed this week's podcast. Thanks for checking out Mental Health Monday. My name is Mick Coyle. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Mick Coyle. You can also find me, Mick Coyle, on Facebook as well. Don't forget, if you want to speak to somebody about your mental health, you can do so. The Samaritans, uh, free to call on 116 123. You can find mental health services where you are. Just look for the Hub of Hope. Type in your postcode. It'll find those mental health services close to you. And for support in a crisis, you can text SHOUT to 85258 that's if you're experiencing a personal crisis you're unable to cope and need support uh, shout to 
to 85258. That's a text line. Do get involved in those services. In an absolute emergency, always remember the number to call is 999. Thanks for downloading the podcast this week. We'll be back next week with more Mental Health Monday.